Having your own rental property can do wonders for your cash flow. I shared mine last week on my investing highs and lows, yet many of us are fearful that initial leaps into landlording is going to be really tricky. Murphy's Law gets us all worried about each and every possible thing that could go wrong. It's just the way it was for every one of us. And it's best to squash these fears ahead of time by proper planning. So today what we're gonna be doing is taking you through our top tips for a smooth transition into becoming a landlord. It's coming up next. All right, guys, welcome back to the VIP Financial Education Channel. We're here to help you go further, faster financially. You're known as the cash flowers. I'm known as Matthew Pillmore. I'm the president of VIP Financial Education, and we work one on one with business owners, real estate investors, and consumers to help them advance to their financial goals in a small fraction of the time. And today, we're going to be taking a look at rental properties. We talk a lot about real estate on this channel, but today I wanna to talk specifically about what you should be doing in order to make the most out of your property as a landlord. Tip number one, I recommend finding a great tenant. That probably goes without saying, but oftentimes we hear horror stories from our coaching members where they were just a bit too relaxed about picking their tenant and it ended up biting them later. Now, if you feel too rushed to find a tenant, it can lead to bad decision-making. So don't get yourself caught in that situation. The best way to ensure you're getting a great tenant is through background checks. Yes, it can take a bit of extra time. You might spend a little bit of money on it, but it'll pay dividends for you when it saves you the frightening costs that come with having that nightmare tenant. Now we take a three-pronged approach in our background checks. First, what we do is we pull credit reports. You can do your own research through one of the credit reporting agencies like Equifax, Experian, or TransUnion. Just be sure that you follow the guidelines of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Secondly, we check criminal history. A great resource for this is landlord.com, which offers tips on how to do it. You can also search state and local records online fairly easily. Third part of our background check is references. And this is one that's really important, one that I've stood behind through my entire career as a landlord. Because there are plenty of bad tenants out there with ideal credit and lack of criminal history, you're gonna to wanna to contact employers and previous landlords to really get the best sense of what kind of tenant you're getting. Now, one thing I wanna add on this that might work well for you as well. Oftentimes, somebody's not going to put references on an application which they think might give them a bad review. So they're only putting close friends, employers that they really had a great relationship with. That's what I would expect. So some of the questions that I'll ask are tailored to challenge those people as to what might their greatest weakness be. I'm looking for them to kind of be a little more transparent with me. If you could change anything about this person, what do you think their greatest weakness of being a tenant might look like? So be a little bit more creative with your question asking. The second tip is to set a competitive price. Do your research. You've got to find out what similar properties are going for in your neighborhood and your, in your community. Remember that potential tenants will be looking for deals. So the more competitive your pricing is, obviously, the more people you'll have to select from. Also, when you're posting your rental property online, be sure to highlight all the valuable aspects of your property. It's often recommended to visit websites like Zillow.com and really see how descriptions are worded, which you might have a use for inside your description. Another thing I would also recommend that was one of the best tips I was ever provided came from one of my closest friends, Art Vasquez, a really, really active real estate investor in the Denver area here. He's been responsible for hundreds and hundreds of wholesale transactions. He's flipped dozens and dozens of homes as well. And one of the things that he does when he's dealing with long-term rentals is he'll sample the neighborhood. So you may wanna just throw a bandit sign or two in your neighborhood. Just make sure you're following all the rules of your HOAs and your, and your general area and put on there similar features to your home. So three bedroom, two bath and put a rental price on there and start gauging the number of phone calls that you get. If you're not getting any phone calls at all on busy intersections, you can bet that the price point that you've put on the sign is probably too high. At that point, you can come down, test it again. And this is a really great trick that you can take with you and use months in advance of actually listing the property for rent so that you have somebody lined up the very first day. The third tip is to always protect yourself with a lease. Again, I think this goes without saying, but it's super important. I've seen so many people get burned because they skip this step. It often happens with friends or with family. That's where we'll see it most of the time. No matter what, make sure you have a signed lease that protects all your interests. Your lease should really include critical aspects like the term, security deposit, how much is due each month and when, what your late penalties are, routine upkeep and maintenance. Now, not long ago, we recently did a video where we were talking about the value behind prepaid legal 
or what's now known as Legal Shield. I've been a Legal Shield member for probably close to a decade, and I always have these types of contracts reviewed by my team through Legal Shield to make sure that I'm not doing something I shouldn't do. Early, early on in my career as a landlord, it turns out I was actually including a number of different things in my lease that I was not supposed to be including, like exorbitant fees for late payments. There are rules to this, guys. And when my lease came back, marked up in red pen, it became obvious to me that you can't just put whatever you want in this thing. It's very important that you're following your local laws. You're also gonna have to identify who's responsible for things like maintenance, repairs, who's responsible for pet policies or, or any type of damage resulting from pets pet deposits, association rules that might exist in your neighborhood that have to be followed, painting regulations inside your home, who paints it, when does it get painted back? What if there's damage from that? Who pays the homeowners association dues? What are the rules of behavior, noise levels, neighborly conduct? I mean, all this stuff, including and especially smoking rules, which can cause some serious long-term damage to your property. So be sure you have a complete lease with each and every tenant. A really terrific resource for something like this is an individual by the name of Jeffrey Taylor, also known as Mr. Landlord. I would look into his information as well. He's got some tremendous ideas behind how to build a bulletproof relationship with your tenants. The fourth tip I want to give you is protecting your property with insurance. This one is, again, fairly obvious, but many people aren't aware that you need a different policy if you're renting a property to a tenant rather than having it as your primary residence. As a landlord, you're going to need rental home insurance, also known as fire insurance in some cases. This policy is going to cover your home structure, any legal costs, medical expenses, loss of rental income in the event that repairs might be needed. Since you're not responsible for the tenant belongings, you should also encourage or even require your tenants to have their own rental insurance policies as well. This is something I always require in advance of actually handing over the keys. We need that policy and every single year needs to be shown so that we can continue the lease forward. The fifth tip is hiring a management company or being ready to put in a little bit of work. Real estate, contrary to what a lot of people might suggest, is not entirely passive. This is all about finding the right move for you. So depending on who you are and what your time constraints are, what your comfort levels are, what your lifestyle design looks like, this may or may not be something that you wanna do. I've always managed my own properties personally because I have a great relationship with my tenants. I empower my tenants. In fact, one of the things I do if there is ever any minor repair that needs to happen is allow my tenant to get the repair done on their own. They simply take pictures and video of what's going on. They communicate the issue. I obviously punctually respond. They then seek out and find the solution, at which point they're probably paying $50, $100, maybe a couple hundred dollars more for that solution than I might be able to find if I took the time to search it and they just simply remove it from next month's rent and send me the check along with the receipt. Guys, I'm not interested in saving 50 or $100 and spending an hour or two to do it. Over time, as you begin to value your time more and more and more, those are just simply write-offs that are, you're willing to make because your time is far more valuable doing something else. So you've gotta ask yourself, are you willing to put in the upfront hours of not just finding the right tenants, and doing the advertising and running around and doing the checks, or would you just be more comfortable paying somebody else to do that? Guys, filling a property typically ranges from 50% to 150% of one month's rent. So weigh that as an option. Beyond just listing and finding a tenant, you can also have a property manager that takes care of everything moving forward. And a big advantage, of course, in property managers is emotional distance. But if you're not too worried about the possibility of getting emotionally involved in the landlord process, in the tenant transaction, then you feel you can spare the time, you might be better off managing the property yourself. That's been my experience. I don't wanna pay 10% of what I'm bringing in every month on my rental income to a property manager. So I'm willing to deal with the two or three interactions that might happen each year per property for the large sum of cash flow that comes in from each one. It's all about weighing the options and then making your choice based on what makes the best sense for you and you alone. All right, guys, finally, the last tip for today's episode is being properly prepared for evictions. This is one we don't like to think about, but it's a reality of real estate investing. When you're becoming a landlord, sometimes you end up with that terrible tenant that you need to get rid of, you're gonna need to hire an attorney to evict any tenants. So just make sure you have one in case the situation should arise. Keep in mind that if the tenant doesn't leave willingly, you can't just go in and move out their personal property. You actually have to go to court and generally the sheriff is gonna to need to be involved to physically remove the person. 
Lastly, legal fees for an eviction can range from anywhere between $300 all the way up to $1,000 or even more. So you've gotta be prepared for that. A couple quick tips about that. Again, Legal Shield is a terrific resource. You can go back in and find the Legal Shield video that we've posted. We'll also put the link in the description below for that. You can speak with Lisa Melville. They've been tremendous for us in many different ways so that we can handle a process like that if it were to ever come up. It's my personal opinion that you should never have to deal with evictions. The only time I've ever had an issue with a nightmare tenant was because I adopted that tenant when I purchased the property. It was a multi-unit property. This tenant was horrible and yes, they caused a lot of damage. It wasn't intentional. They weren't bad people trying to hurt me. They were just irresponsible adults and unfortunately, because of a missed energy payment, their pipes froze, water flooded the apartment, and we ended up having to get them out. Now, luckily, they left willingly and realized their mistakes and were voluntarily willing to just get out of my hair. But we were able to uh, to get them out. And, and the point is that with an attorney on standby, you guys can do far more than without. So I definitely recommend having somebody on deck so that if anything were to happen, you can get all those questions taken care of for you. Guys, to wrap things up, I just want you to keep all of these things in mind. You can easily understand the difficulties that can come from having bad tenants. I think this is one of the most common fears that new real estate investors or wannabe real estate investors all share. I'd love to hear from you. What experiences have you had where you've either dealt with a bad tenant or you've had a terrific tenant please throw those comments in the section below. If you have any additional tips that have worked really well for you, we'd love to hear from you and we'll add them to our next list. Make sure you hit that like button if you want us to do more videos like this on real estate and how we've become successful using real estate as a wealth creation vehicle. Also, you're gonna wanna subscribe to the channel. If you want to continue to be a cash flower, hit that subscribe button, turn on the bell notifications, and you'll be alerted every single time. You can be one of the first people to see some of the cutting edge information we're talking about here on the VIP Financial Ed platform. We upload a few times a week, so make sure that uh, you're on the lookout for those notifications. Just a reminder as well, for those of you who haven't yet taken advantage of our free one-on-one -on -one phone-based coaching session, it's a courtesy, it's just a gift that we provide you for being a viewer here on the channel. You can do that by visiting freecoachingcalendar.com. We'll put that in the description below as well to make it convenient for you. I just wanna say thank you again for checking out our channel. We're well on our way to 75,000 subscribers subscribers already. We really appreciate you as a viewer. Until we see you on the next video, make it a great day today and take care.